Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 13th meeting of 2019. We have apologies from Shona Robinson and welcome back to committee Bill Kitt, who is substituting for Shona. Agenda item one is the decision on taking items four and five in private, which is consideration of a draft report on the Brexit subordinate legislation that the committee has considered to date and the committee's forward work programme. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed, thank you. Agenda item two is continued consideration of the management of Offender Scotland to bill at stage two. I refer members to a copy of the bill on the marshalled list of amendments and groupings for this item. And I welcome back Humza Youssef, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials to the meeting. And we will be joined by, uh, at various parts of the meeting by other members who have lodged amendments. We now begin our consideration of amendments and I call amendment 75 in the name of Liam Kerr grouped with amendment 134 Liam Kerr to move amendment 75 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you convener. Uh, good morning. Uh, the committee's stage one report recognised at recommendation 182 that robust risk assessment procedures are critical to the effective use of HDCs and other forms of electronic monitoring. And the committee agrees with the calls made in evidence taken about the importance of ensuring that decisions on electronic monitoring are informed by proper and appropriate assessments. The report went on to note that we needed more information on the risk assessment tool. Uh, and I raised this in my speech at stage one of this bill, and I do recall the Cabinet Secretary's response in what I felt was a, a, a very good debate. Uh, I remain of that view that surely before we do anything to increase the numbers who are on electronic monitoring, we need a, a robust and trusted assessment tool. Now, I do understand from listening to the Cabinet Secretary previously that the development of such a tool takes time, but we cannot allow it to drag uh, and this is my significant concern here because, for example, I'm looking at another piece of legislation in another committee right now in which the Scottish Government was required to develop a database, but nine years later it's not even been started and we cannot risk that sort of outcome here. So my amendment today, convener, requires the Scottish Government to develop such a tool, a risk assessment tool, in an effort to uh, press the importance that this is not delayed uh, and it also of course goes on to say that the courts will have to have regard to that tool when disposing of cases and requiring the ministers to publish a report on the operation of that risk assessment tool. So I think it is the right amendment, uh, I think it is important that this goes in uh, and for that reason I certainly move this amendment in my name. Uh, I think, convener, you were asking if I would speak to Daniel Johnson's Amendment 76 as well. Uh, uh, no. Is that right yes, in that group or yes, is that please. separate? Uh, I simply uh, say on that that I see entirely where Daniel Johnson is going. Uh, I'd be, I'm very interested to hear uh, his representations uh, in terms of the operation of that amendment, uh, but certainly in principle I think there, there is a lot of merit to Daniel Johnson's amendment. Daniel Johnson to speak to amendment 134 and the other amendment in the group. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and can I thank uh, uh, Liam Kerr for setting out in his introduction the reasons for this, and, and indeed my amendment uh, has been tabled for entirely uh, the same uh, uh, reasons, both uh, set out in our Stage 1 report, and more importantly, set out in uh, the HMI PS and HMI CS reports. That is, that there was an issue uh, with regard to, to risk assessment. And I think what is important, and there, there have been a number of discussions about this, and I understand what the Cabinet Secretary has said when he's previously uh, been in front of committee about not putting the details of a, a risk assessment process on the face of the bill, and I agree with him on that. But, however, and as I've said to him uh, in, in private, I think what is important that is on the face of the bill is that such a risk assessment does take place, which was, uh, in essence, the intent behind uh, my amendment, was to ensure that that, that risk assessment 
did take place, but without being unduly burdensome in terms of the specification um, of that risk assessment process, uh, providing for flexibility um, uh, 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 and indeed uh, uh, reflection within uh, that. Um, with regard to how my amendment sits next to Liam Kerr's, I, I believe that broadly they're, they're complementary. I, I have two slight issues with Liam Kerr's uh, 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 amendment, which is why I'm going to uh, move mine. First is uh, in terms of language. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that um, uh, putting a, a tool, a risk assessment tool, uh, uh, formally on the face of the bill is uh, appropriate, given that that is potentially uh, anachronistic and potentially goes into detail. However, I, I mean, I don't believe that it's overly specified in terms of his amendment, but more importantly, that point of ensuring that that risk assessment takes place. My reading of Liam Kerr's amendment is that while it requires ministers to develop the risk assessment tool, it doesn't actually require them to use it. Um, and my uh, amendment in particular does actually require the implementation of the risk assessment. Um, and so therefore, I, I uh, am going to both uh, vote in support of uh, Liam Kerr's amendment, but also mine, because I believe mine is necessary to make sure that that risk assessment is carried out. I believe that there will be a, a requirement to do a little uh, tidying up um, at stage three, but I don't believe that there's anything in either of amendments which conflict um, uh, with one another and that they are complementary. But most importantly, I think in terms of establishing that trust in the risk assessment process, making sure that there's scrutiny of that risk assessment process, I believe that these amendments are critical uh, in, in terms of um, this bill um, being effective in terms of its intent and restoring public trust in uh, HDC, which is ultimately a, a, a vital tool in terms of our ability to rehabilitate uh, prisoners. Thank you. Anthony? I won't be supporting either of these amendments. Um, did, uh, likewise, I'm concerned about some of the language. For instance, if I noted correctly, there was a process. It's important a risk assessment does take place, robust and tested. I think we've heard very clearly that uh, w w what we know anyway is the entire Scottish prison service, almost everything is subject to a risk assessment, whether that's the movement of individual prisoners within that, any activities within that. And what we do know, too, is that there, there's been very clearly there was a process in place for assessing the use previously. Now, I think this committee was quite entirely right to halt its considerations pending the examination that took place. But what we have heard from there is a significant change around in the, the position of the number of uh, um, people who are being granted this. I think we've introduced risk aversion. I, I have every confidence in the Scottish Press Service, indeed uh, uh, criminal justice social workers, to, to, to do this. I think these are entirely well-meaning, but legislation based on any particular incident... Went, yes, indeed. I uh, thank John Finney for taking that intervention. Um, I, I, I do hear what you're saying, but if it is open, or, or first of all, I'm sure John Finney will accept that there appear to have been failures previously which led to the situation we were in, uh, which to my mind almost mandates that we set out the lessons learned and what should happen going forward. Um, but secondly, I, I do understand why he says that risk aversion has been introduced into the system. If it is so possible to, to swing from one approach to another approach, surely he would accept that that is not what our justice system should be doing, and it would be far better to, to give a clear instruction, both as my amendment seeks to do and Daniel Johnson seeks to do, on how a risk should be carried out and how it should be taken forward. Well, I thank the member for that intervention. I think an important part of risk assessment is to continually assess the man manner, manner in which you do go about risk assessment. I absolutely readily accept that. But what we've heard unquestionably is a significant drop in the figures. Now, that's not a sustainable position. But we also heard that the risk assessment process, while broadly the same, had been altered as regards the seniority of the, the individuals um, intervening um, um, or making, ultimately making the decision. So, yes, I, I thank the member for taking the intervention. I mean, I entirely agree with him, and it's almost in exactly why I proposed this amendment, because I think at the moment, because of the, the circumstances, there is a degree of... Um, uh, uh, concern uh, uh, in, in terms of undertaking these risk assessments by clearly setting out the, the principles and practice uh, in terms of uh, the, the amendments as, as laid before us. I th 
think that one of the, the outcomes of that will be to give confidence to the SPS and the people carrying out those risk assessments because they know that they'll have the backup of that risk assessment process as set out um, uh, you know, per the, these amendments. So I, I think actually these amendments do exactly what he, I think, would want to happen in terms of building that confidence and, and seeing HDC used effectively and entirely properly within the, the prison service. Again, I hear what the member says. Um, just because you assess a risk and put in place mechanisms to ameliorate that risk, it doesn't mean that you ultimately eliminate the risk. And you're not going to ever do that when you're dealing with humans and you're relying on a point in the, uh, on judgment. This isn't some mechanical exercise that's going to take place. This involves human beings. But um, I, I don't doubt the, the good intent of both members, but I won't be supporting their amendments. Thank you. Fulton, then Rona. Uh, thanks, Convener. I, I mean, I'd just like to echo a lot of uh, what John Finney uh, said there, I, I think that these amendments almost seem to come from a point where there's no risk assessment in place, and I'm sure that's not the intention, and I'm sure that um, Liam Kerr will, will reflect that in his summing up, but, but to me that, that's, that's where they come from, as if, there's, as if there's already no risk assessment in place and we need to put something in as parliamentarians, and I can tell people uh, around the table from my experience what in the criminal justice system, as John Finney said, that couldn't be further from the truth. So. There is, of course, robust risk assessments in place. Are they perfect? No, I don't think MD, MD would suggest that. And we know that the, the recent example tells us that. But I think we need to uh, place our trust with the, the relevant organisations. Uh, again, as John Finney said, rather than putting this on the face of the bill uh, and, and down to Scottish Government officials so, uh, and, and ministers. So I, would, um, I, I won't be backing these amendments. Rona. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, I won't be backing uh, the amendments either. Um, Liam, Liam Kerr used the words a clear instruction. I don't think his amendment is a clear instruction. I think it's quite vague. I mean, what is a tool? We don't know what that is. Is it for pre-release or post-release? Um, so I, I think it's, it's, just, it's just far too vague. I, th I think it's you know, well-intentioned, and uh, as, as Daniel says, I can see the motivation behind it. And for uh, Daniel Johnson's, I think, um, again, again it's, it's quite vague. It requires ministers to make a kind of unspecified provision about um, risk assessment. It appears to be aimed at individual risk assessments rather than the overarching um, policy of, of risk assessment. And uh, just to take up John Finney's point about the, 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 the turnaround, um, I don't think it would be um, advantageous at this time to, to bring the, these uh, amendments forward. Um, well, my view is that these um, both complement each other. They both seek to provide a, a robust uh, a assessment tool in which the public can have confidence. Uh, they require the development of this in light of the expansion of HDC to individuals who would otherwise be behind bars. And while I note um, members' uh, comments that there are already existing risk assessments, they have been found wanting in the past, and I think we need to be very conscious of that. In terms of the um, concern that we all share about the risk-averse um, culture that seems to have come uh, developed, then it seems to me that by having this robust tool on the face of the bill, that will address that culture of risk assessment and help people to have confidence that they can use HDC as um, it was intended to be used in this legislation. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Can I thank uh, Liam Kerr and Daniel Johnson uh, for their amendments? I know they come from uh, a very, very uh, sincere in intent. Uh, both members uh, and indeed yourself, Convener, have been very consistent since stage one um, of the bill and, and thereafter, particularly um, after after the, the, the HTC reviews, um, very consistent in, in this point around risk management, uh, the need for robust tools, uh, but also your request to have something on a statutory footing. Um, so I'm really grateful for, for the fact that um, both amendments uh, have been lodged, as I say. I know they've come up not just from members, but in very consistent theme of conversation, discussion and debate, uh, from those that you took evidence from um, also. In, in relation to Amendment uh, 75, uh, there was a discussion at stage one about the merits of placing risk assessment on the face of the bill. I, I have to say I'm still very firmly of the view that to do so would present uh, a risk, and I believe that the, the Risk Management Authority have written to the Justice Committee expressing their concerns. My, my, my usual concerns about putting things on the face of the bill very much extend to, to, to this amendment around the potential inflexibility 
um, of, of, of what's being um, suggested uh, and, 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 and I think there's a better place for it. All that being said, I fully recognise why the members would want to have something that has a statutory underpinning uh, to it. So I'm hoping that throughout this, uh, throughout my remarks, I can perhaps uh, bring forward a compromise position that can satisfy members' desire to have um, risk management um, on, on a statutory footing, but doesn't necessarily involve it being on, on the face of the bill, and I'll come to that uh, very shortly. Uh, in terms of just some of the language used in Amendment 75, a risk assessment tool, um, it's not defined here nor elsewhere in the legislation. There are already a number of risk assessment tools used in the criminal justice system that are developed for the use uh, with particular groups of prisoners and, of course, developed for particular situations. Um, it's not clear from Amendment 75 what sort of risk ass assessment tool would be uh, created, uh, one to assist the decision to release a prisoner or, indeed, one to assist the management of risk uh, once that prisoner uh, is released. Uh, risk assessment carried out by the Governor in relation to temporary release, uh, of course, would be very different to risk assessments carried out for the purposes of HDC uh, or, indeed, parole. Uh, the creation of one risk ass assessment tool for all three very distinct forms of early release overlooks the very different nature uh, of the various forms of, of early release. Uh, my, my understanding is that letters were sent to the committee both from the Risk Management Authority and also uh, from, from the Pro Board. And I may just read out uh, a paragraph just to emphasise that point. This is a letter from the Risk Management Authority, um, which talks about its frame, uh, the, the, the framework for, for, for risk assessment management and evaluation. Um, and, and it just says in the uh, fourth paragraph down, frame emphasises the distinction between risk assessment and tools and that there are a range of instruments that may contribute to a risk assessment but none that in itself produces a risk uh, assessment. Such tools vary greatly in the design purpose and applicability, and there's not one that fits all situations. Uh, the Pro Board, uh, in their letter to, to committee, uh, in their fifth, uh, sorry, fourth bullet point uh, down, say the adoption and promotion of one generic tool oversimplifies the complex process of risk assessment, which should be informed as appropriate by specific relevant assessment tools but should also involve wider evidence uh, and, and expertise. So that just goes to emphasise the point that I'm hoping um, to make. I, th I think the, the amendment would duplicate uh, existing risk assessment processes uh, across all forms of early release, uh, and there are existing statutory provisions requiring risk assessment for the purposes of HDC, for temporary release, uh, and also uh, parole. And if it's helpful for the committee, of course, uh, I, I can provide some more detail on that uh, in writing. Um, the obligation in Amendment 75 to develop a risk assessment tool sits alone with no corresponding duty on any organisation to use the tool or to have regards to it. There is a duty to consult certain bodies, and it may be implied that those bodies uh, are to have regard to the risk uh, of that tool. Yes. Would my amendment not actually uh, do uh, just that and, uh, and give the duty to, to carry out the, that risk assessment if both are passed? Potentially, but, uh, and then I'll come to why that might actually be a bit of a problem uh, and, and also why the, the amendment in itself and the way it's drafted might actually be a problem. Because, um, as I say, it could be implied, although it's, it's not specific, but it could be implied um, that, that those bodies have to have regard to risk assessment tools. But one of those bodies that would then have to do that would, of course, be, uh, be consulted would be the Pro Board. Uh, and the Pro Board is completely independent of, of Scottish ministers and any implication that the Pro Board is bound by a risk assessment developed by Scottish ministers could call that independence uh, into questions. That could, of course, then give rise to a potential challenge to the Pro Board's decisions under uh, on, on parole under ECHR Article 6, that's the right to a fair trial. Uh, and again, uh, I understand the Pro Board have written to you in that same letter, again, if I just quote directly on, on, on the fifth bullet point, uh, down in their letter, uh, they say, mandating a single tool could be seen as tying the hands of, an independent, of, of, of independent bodies and reducing the effectiveness of decision-making bodies. And I know from my uh, both public and private conversations with members uh, around this committee that they greatly value the independence uh, of, of, of the pro board, and, and rightly so. In relation to Amendment um, 134, um, there are some significant drafting uh, concerns, which some have been alluded to already, uh, that mean that this amendment would be, uh, I think, unworkable if it formed part of the bill. Uh, firstly, the obligation in subsection 1 refers to the risk assessment of an individual prisoner rather than the risk assessment process as it applies to prisoners uh, in general. Uh, the obligation could therefore require the Scottish ministers to assess the risk posed by one prisoner rather than to create a general risk assessment process, which obviously would not be the intention. 
uh, behind the amendment. The obligation in subsection 1 uh, must be complied with only once in the six months immediately after commencement, as the amendment inadvertently refers to an individual risk assessment rather than a risk assessment uh, process. So the Scottish Government could comply uh, with the obligation by conducting just one individual risk assessment in six months following commencement. Uh, while the amendment appears to be designed to relate to HDC uh, only, the drafting could result in the amendment applying to all forms of release from prison, where the prisoner is released on licence or otherwise. So it's not clear whether subsection 1 obliges ministers to conduct a risk assessment for the purposes of assisting the decision to release a prisoner or assisting the management of risk once the prisoner is released uh, from, 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 from prison. Um, both of these uh, amendments, uh, I know, seek to address risk. Um, however, uh, and, and I understand, again, their desire to, to have uh, some of this on, on, on a statutory uh, footing. So uh, my, my, my proposal is that uh, having regard to Amendment 130 from the convener uh, may provide uh, an opportunity to address the issue of risk more broadly uh, and therefore hopefully satisfy uh, the concerns of members. Amendment 130 in the, in the next group seeks to make guidance on HTC st uh, statutory. Um, I accept the principle that HTC guidance um, should have a statutory footing uh, and should be laid before Parliament. Uh, the HTC guidance contains a number of different components, including the purpose of HTC, but it also sets out detail on eligibility and the consideration to be taken in assessing risk. So if, if Daniel Johnson and, and Liam Kerr are minded uh, in light of those concerns to not press their amendments, then I think creating statutory HTC guidance to be laid before Parliament, as the convener suggests, and including some of the elements of what's discussed by both members, and will hopefully um, uh, allay some of the concerns that they have around risk. So I extend to them uh, the offer that I will make to the convener in, in, in the next uh, grouping on Amendment 130 to work with them on a form of uh, on a form of that amendment at stage three, which ensures that the guidance covering HDC uh, will, of course, provide that uh, guidance on a statutory footing, but include the provision on risk. Uh, as well. So I'd request that uh, Daniel Johnson and, and Liam Kerr do not press these amendments, but if they are pressed, then I would urge the committee to reject them. Liam Kerr to wind up, press or withdraw. Uh, thank you, convener. I'm grateful to the committee and the Cabinet Secretary for the comments. Uh, just dealing with some of the concerns expressed by the committee, um, I think John Finney makes it an important uh, and interesting argument, but uh, I, I don't just accept it. I, I take the point about the aversion apparently seeming to have been introduced, but surely the most effective way to ensure appropriateness and fairness and consistency is to clearly set out how we risk assess and, and what the, the benchmark is, is going to be. And you're quite right, of course, Mr Finney, we can't eliminate risk, but we can surely reduce it. And the best way to do that is through some form of test like this. Uh, turning to Fulton McGregor, uh, he made some uh, points that my starting point is that there is no risk assessment in place and that there are systems there already and of course that's quite true. Uh, Mr McGregor suggested that we, we should place our trust in the systems that, that are there pre-existing but respectfully that is what we were doing before and we saw that there were tragic consequences arising for that I think of course. Indeed, I agree with much of what the member just said, and indeed, in terms of what Fulton McGregor said, I accept that there was not uh, nothing in place before, but if you look at paragraph 6.6 .6 of the HMIPS report, it states that whilst an assessment process clearly existed, it may not be really regarded by some to meet the definition of robust. It then goes on to make, uh, state very explicitly the terms by, uh, 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 by which a risk assessment should be established in order to uh, 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 address that issue, which is what I think, and I wonder if the member would agree with me, our amendments seek to do. Uh, well, I do agree with that. I'm grateful for, for the intervention. I think that's exactly the point that certainly I'm making and clearly Daniel Johnson is making too. And I think, yes, of course. Point, thanks so much. I thank the member if I let me and I hear the points of both Liam Kerr and Daniel Johnson, Johnson are making. And I said when, uh, when I spoke on the amendment as well that, uh, of course, the, the risk assessment process isn't perfect. Um, as John Finney said earlier, we're, we're dealing with human beings. But I think where we disagree is where the changes the power to make changes should be made. And I, and I heard what the Cabinet Secretary said there, and I think that that is a very reasonable offer for compromise that he's put forward to both yourself and Daniel Johnson for the next uh, section, and I would encourage you to accept that, because it's not, it's no, nobody's saying that there's a perfect system in place, but where we disagree is how the changes can be made. 
to certainly deal with the Amendment 130 in, in two seconds, but uh, I, I wonder, Mr McGregor, does that suggest that you accept uh, Daniel Johnson's argument and my argument on this, that, that we, we shouldn't be placing our trust in the previous systems and that actually there is merit to moving forward uh, and doing something differently, in which case uh, I might I respectfully suggest that bringing these amendments forward might be the way... Uh, uh, to do that. Are you letting me back in as of an course. intervention to answer that? Uh, well, thanks again then. Uh, no, no, I don't agree with that, that premise because the current system that's in place has already currently got the ability to change and, and, and make, uh, make relevant, relevant changes as required. I think it do, does still need further work and that's what I think what the Cabinet Secretary has outlined in his, um, his speech. I'm grateful for the intervention. Uh, so moving on to the Cabinet Secretary's points. First of all, uh, Cabinet Secretary, when referring to my Amendment 75, uh, understandably suggested that it's going to be very difficult to try and design something to cover all situations. Uh, but I might point him towards uh, my subsection 2, which makes clear, because I understand the point being made if you come at it from that end. Uh, but actually, if we look at subsection 2, the purpose of the risk assessment tool is to assess the risk of an offender being at liberty to the safety, safety of the public at large. Now, that's a very different approach. That's not narrowing it down to a particular uh, disposal or a particular consideration. That is saying, what is going to happen? What is the risk to the public at large if this particular offender is at liberty? Uh, and so, to my mind, that is a, an all-encompassing purpose that can be uh, put in place. Uh, so I think I can deal with that objection. Uh, but turning to a substantive point, I'm, I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for his offer on Amendment 130, and I, I see the merit to that. Uh, but again, I refer back to the purpose at subsection 2 about assessing the risk of an offender, whatever that offender has done, whatever situation they're in, being at liberty to the safety of the public at large. I think that's the right purpose. I think that's the uh, end of the telescope we should be looking through. Uh, and for that reason, I think there is absolute merit in this Amendment 75, and therefore I do move it in my name. Okay. The question is that Amendment 75 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. No. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Right. Um, six against, three for. That amendment is not agreed. Call amendment 134 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with amendment 75. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Move. Mm, that amendment is moved. Are we all agreed? No. Um, the question is that amendment 134, we were not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against? Three, six. Three in favour, six against. That amendment is not agreed. Call amendment 130 in my name in a group on its own. Um, and I'll move this and speak to amendment 130. Amendment 130 addresses the monitoring and evaluation of home detention curfews and licence conditions. This has been lodged in response to the findings of the HMIPS in October 2018, which noted that where an individual's release on HDC was subject to additional conditions, not just electronic monitoring conditions, there appeared to be no monitoring of compliance. In its conclusions, the committee stated it did not consider this to be acceptable and agreed with HMIPS that additional conditions need to be accompanied by monitoring arrangements and that these are agreed in advance and clearly annotated on the licence. Furthermore, if this is not possible, the committee recommended that serious consideration be given to not granting the HDC. In particular, the committee noted recommendation 9 from HMIPS calling on the Scottish Government to develop statutory guidance with regard to these issues. The committee then called on the Scottish Government to consider making provision for this in the Bill, requiring the Government to consult on, publish and um, maintain guidance setting out the roles, 
and responsibilities of the relevant agencies with regard to risk assessment and monitoring of conditions relating to the use of electronic tagging conditions. The amendment therefore provides that ministers must monitor compliance with the curfew condition and any additional conditions imposed as part of the licence conditions. It also states that where a condition has not been complied with, the Scottish, Scottish ministers may revoke the licence and return the individual to prison. More specifically, it provides that after this section comes into force, the Scottish Government must publish and lay before Parliament guidance on the monitoring of conditions. The amendment further provides that Scottish ministers must review this guidance and also consult with relevant bodies when doing this review. I move Amendment 30 in my name. 130 in my name. Do um, any members, other members have comments or questions? Daniel Johnson. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you, and thank you very much for uh, bringing this amendment forward. I, I, I believe um, this is possibly one of the most uh, important amendments that has been tabled because it goes to the very heart of uh, what went wrong in the tragic case of Craig McClelland and indeed addresses directly, um, I think, one of the most important points made um, in the, the reports uh, by HMI PS and HMI CS. Um, it, it is vital that um, if conditions are applied to, to people released on, on HDC that the, those conditions and indeed any issues flagged and any risk assessment that has undertaken that those, those are monitored. That monitoring was not taking place and therefore that's why this is so critical and, and why I will be supporting it. And just briefly to, to touch on what the Cabinet Secretary uh, mentioned in the previous section, I mean I quite agree that, that this goes some way to addressing those points. I, I, however, I, I don't believe that monitoring conditions is a substitute um, for, for addressing risk management. But nonetheless, given that the, the previous amendments on risk assessment um, uh, did not pass, I, I believe this amendment is absolutely vital uh, to this bill. And without it, I, I believe will be, uh, this bill will be seriously deficient. Rona? <coughs> oh, sorry. Rona. Um, yeah, I mean, I totally understand the motivation for this. And I, I agree with what Daniel says. My, my, my reservation is that it's... It almost uh, replicates existing legislation. I mean, monitoring is already possible under the existing legislation in the bill. Um, already places responsibility for um, electronic monitoring arrangements on ministers. But I think if something could be worked out to do with maybe the wording around it to um, to um, accentuate this, that would be helpful. Um, if uh, you know, to, to strengthen the point, but I, I think to actually um, bring this in, it would just be replicating existing legislation. No one else, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. <coughs> I can say from the outset, um, I have uh, a huge amount of sympathy uh, for large parts uh, of this amendment. The duty to monitor compliance uh, with HDC conditions and the power to revoke an HD licence if those conditions are breached um, are, of course, already provided for in existing legislation. However, um, I do consider that there is some merit in the creation of a, a statutory, uh, in the creation of statutory guidance for HDC. Um, HMI CS and HMI PS made recommendations in their reports on HDC in October 2018 in relation to the need for, and I quote, an extensive review of home detention curfew guidance. Uh, that work has started, but it will not be concluded until we're able to take account of the changes made through this bill, such as the changes. Uh, to the powers of, of, of recall, for example. Um, it should be borne in mind that giving the HDC guidance a statutory footing would not necessarily um, materially change the obligations placed on the Scottish ministers um, or those other organisations tasked with delivering the HDC regime. The nature of guidance um, is that it's not binding, even if a duty is placed uh, on certain persons to have regard to it. Um, however, um, all, all of that being said, um, the statutory guidance prepared um, by Scottish ministers would, would require to be aimed at other criminal uh, justice organisations involved in delivering HTC. Um, as drafted, this amendment does not place any duty uh, on the criminal justice organisations involved in delivering HTC to have regard to the guidance. Um, this amendment would require the Scottish ministers produce guidance gov covering the monitoring of compliance with HTC licence conditions, which are just one element of the HTC scheme. Um, Scottish ministers already provide guidance covering 
a wider, um, wider than just monitoring range of roles and functions uh, of different justice partners in the administration of HDC, uh, and it may be possible that this guidance could form the basis uh, of statutory, statutory guidance that the convener um, is seeking here. Um, however, if the convener is not uh, is content, sorry, not to press her uh, amendment, then I'm happy to work with her and, as per previous discussions with Liam Kerr and Daniel Johnson, to develop an amendment. Uh, to return with at stage three that would require Scottish ministers to produce statutory guidance on the administration of HDC more generally, which may address the concerns expressed by members about other aspects of HDC, such as risk assessment pre-release or indeed risk assessment uh, post-release. I can't thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for these comments. I, this is a, a really important amendment given what's happened in the past and the fact we know that conditions and licences were actually not being monitored. Couldn't be more serious than that. So what the amendment does is reflect how seriously the committee took this issue and the recommendations, notwithstanding what Rona said, um, the recommendations um, that we made. Uh, and so for that basis, I'm minded to press it. However, um, if there are deficiencies in it, if it passes, if it doesn't pass, I would very gratefully take up the Cabinet Secretary's um, offer to work on it at stage three. So with that in mind, I press this amendment in my name. And the question is therefore, that um, is that should amendment 130 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. no. All those in favour, please show. All those against, please show. Six, three. three in favour, six against. That amendment is not passed. Call amendment 133 in the na my name in a group on its own, uh, which I'll move and speak to. Amendment 133 seeks to amend the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act, uh, Scotland Act 1995 to impose particular restrictions of liberty conditions. It seeks to clarify and give a better understanding of the precise location or area covered by any exclusion zone condition. Exclusion zones place restrictions on the ability of abusers to have access to specific locations where their victim may be found. The amendment therefore gives examples of specific locations such as the offender's home, the offender's child's school or their partner or ex-partner's workplace. It also provides for exclusion areas and named locations. Amendment 130 is particularly relevant for the domestic abuse perpetrators in that it seeks to prevent these offenders from causing further distress to their victims by excluding them from various locations and places where they could seek to confront or harass their victims. Um, I move Amendment 133 in my name. Do members have any comments? Move straight. Sorry, Rona. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Um, I, um, you know, I, again can understand why the Convener has brought this this amendment, and um, I think it may relate to some, some concerns that Women's Aid had around the, the, the use of, of GPS. Um, but the, the amendment, as it's drafted, doesn't actually um, say that, um, and it may end up. Um, I mean, the court can currently designate a specified place as a restricted. Um, a, a restricted a place. The, the amendment as it stands might actually have the effect of restricting the places to, to which the court can exclude an offender, which we, which I know well, is definitely not the intention of the amendment, but I think the drafting of it is a bit problematic. Um, you know, I have complete uh, and utter understanding and sympathy with women aids, con women's aid concerns, and I know that's the intention of the um, amendment, but I just don't think it's clear enough. I don't think it sets out um, enough, and it may have unintended consequences. Fulton? Mm. Uh, likewise, can be I didn't, um, uh, you know, and, and, and not being disrespectful in any manner means, but I didn't um, actually understand, or I don't understand, what the intended effect is. Um, I get the sentiment behind it, um, and I would like to hear, uh, moving into stage three, if it's if it is uh, rejected, um, or if it's passed, um, exactly what women's aid think about. Uh, this, this particular uh, amendment and, and how the intention can perhaps be met, but I, I do wonder about unintended consequences. For example, 
to the nature of domestic abuse, which I think is, is, is the, the amendments mainly uh, based on uh, through women's aid. You know, it, it, there's, there's already issues there with, with restriction of liberty orders that I think the criminal justice system work day in, day out to to try and manage. You know, uh, the nature of coercive control, for example. So I'm really unsure if this. I'll be interested to hear what the cabinet secretary says, and um, and particularly if, if it's going on at stage three. Just on that point, and before I bring the Cabinet Secretary in, because it may be helpful for, for, for him, then the exclusion zones just now can be drafted very wisely. It could be Glasgow White, for example. So this clarifies and tries to put examples, not as, as Rona was seeming to suggest, you no know, places that definitively must be in, but concentrates the mind on places where exclusion zones um, might be targeted um, to bring some clarity and um, conciseness to this, which can only help the, the victims of these um, breaches. Cabinet, sorry. Intervention, if that's all right. Um, I think that's exactly my point. I don't think, I don't know whether that argument that you're making is necessarily uh, likely to be in the best interests of victims of these offences. I'm not saying that it isn't, but I think at this stage with the amendments in front of me, we would need a lot more information before I could vote for it. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. I was interested to hear um, of your intent uh, behind uh, these amendments. And um, I know, you, again, you've had a, and, and continue to have a consistent um, approach to defending the rights of particularly um, victims of, of, of domestic uh, abuse. Um, so I completely understand the, 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 the intent behind um, some of that. Um, I just, I'm not convinced that the amendment uh, is necessarily required um, uh, for this additional ability for ministers to prescribe, quote unquote, a specified place, I'll try to give you some reassurances that those powers already very much exist for the courts, um, and therefore th th there's not a need to, to press this amendment. Um, courts already are able to restrict people on uh, restriction of liberty orders uh, away from or to a broad range uh, of types of specified place, uh, and they already do so under the current radio frequency. Um, service people can currently be restricted away from a partner's house and um, it doesn't have to be a broad geographic location when it comes to electronic monitoring in fact it has to be a very it can be a very specific place courts have under the current service used electronic monitoring to make for example local supermarkets a, a specified place to deter a persistent shoplifter uh, a restriction of liberty order may and, and i'll directly quote from section 245a of the Criminal Procedures Act uh, here, and again, as I, say, as I say, I quote, they, they may restrict the offender's movement to such an extent as the court thinks fit and without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing may include provision A, requiring the offender to be in such place as may be specified for such periods or periods uh, in each day or week as may be specified, B, requiring the offender not to be in such place or places or such class or classes of place or places at such time or during such period as may be specified, end quote. Um, so these are already broad powers. The GPS monitoring capabilities when introduced will just change the ways in which those specified places are monitored. We do not see any need to change how those specified places uh, are defined. Indeed, there's a significant risk that in seeking to pres prescribe the places that can be specified in an RLO, this amendment may be seen as limiting the power of the courts to only specify those places which are prescribed. Um, we're unsure why the ability to prescribe the places which may be specified in an RLO, if it were to be beneficial, would not extend to other forms of electronic monitoring, such as monitoring of licence conditions or indeed sexual offences prevention orders. Uh, overall, this bill has largely sought to leave untouched the underlying orders that can be electronically monitored, uh, as to do so risks opening up a number uh, of unintended consequences that we have not had the opportunity to consider or take evidence uh, on, on the bill to date. Um, on that basis, um, I can't see a clear benefit from an amendment of this nature, um, although I completely respect and sympathise and understand uh, the intent uh, behind it. I should say my officials have also had conversations with a number of uh, organisations representing uh, women, uh, particularly in relation to victims of domestic abuse. And while they have uh, raised concerns in and around the bill, um, my understanding is that they have uh, a very detailed understanding of what can be done currently in the current legislation um, and in terms of uh, restrictions 
uh, with the electronic monitoring. So I would urge uh, Margaret Mitchell not to press uh, the amendment. If the amendment is pressed, I would urge the committee, committee to reject it. But of course, uh, I'm more than happy if it is rejected to work with Margaret Mitchell uh, before stage three uh, and indeed any other stakeholders and members to give her confidence uh, that we have in place the necessary powers uh, to protect vulnerable individuals, particularly victims of domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for these comments. Um, this is an area where we always work together for, for the good. But it seems to me what this amendment does is provide flexibility. The flexibility to prescribe a specific place, but not to have to do that. Um, I noticed the Cabinet Secretary said it might be unduly restrictive for offenders, but currently areas that are um, located as exclusion zone can be city-wide. And that's um, clearly not the most effective use of it, both for um, protecting the victim or um, being proportionate in terms of the, the offender. I'm minded to depress this. Um, my, my whole attitude to um, these, um, these sexual offence uh, offences um, is that we do as much as we possibly can. We provide the belt and braces. I think that amendment, the amendment my name does that. There'll be opportunity at stage three for the organisations to come forward if they've got any um, doubts or reservations about it. And I have to say, no one has, has come forward uh, knowing that I've um, tabled this motion with these doubts, which isn't to say that that may not happen at stage three. So I'm minded to, to move it, but uh, again, if it falls, then um, very willingly take up the Cabinet Secretary's kind offer to, to work and look and see if something else can be put in at stage three. But as it stands, I think this is a good amendment which will increase the protection for... Um, all victims, and particularly those victims of uh, sexual offences. So the question is, um, is Amendment 133 agreed? No. no. All those in favour, please show. All those against, please show. Two in favour, seven against. That amendment is not passed. The question is that Section 48 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, call Amendment 72 in the name of Neil Bibby. Neil Bibby. Um, already debated uh, with Amendment 71. Yeah, yeah. Moved. Not moved. <coughs> not moved. The question is that amendments uh, is not that Amendment 72 because it hasn't been agreed. Uh, moved. Okay. Call Amendment 78 in the name of Liam Kerr. Group. Sorry, 76 in the name of Liam Kerr, grouped with amendments 76A and 80. Liam Kerr to move amendment 76 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Firstly, then, on uh, amendment 76. So, my view is that uh, both monitoring and swift and visible responses to breaches are essential to public safety. I'm sure the committee will accept that proposition. But monitoring and a swift and visible response require sufficient resources to be in place. So the Amendment 76, which I hereby move, will require ministers to prove that resources are in place before the bill comes into force. Uh, throughout the course of this session, uh, looking at various amendments, for example, Amendment 78 or Amendment 131, We've talked, this committee has talked, and rightly, about the need for resources. And many aspects of this bill will be resource intensive. Uh, and so we must get this right. And the implication, it seems to me, of voting down this amendment is that we don't think we should ensure that there are resources in place before doing this. I think that would be somewhat irresponsible and not a course that I can commend to the committee. Uh, since I'm speaking to the group, uh, I will be supporting the further amendment 76A in the name of Daniel Johnson, as it provides extra clarity to my amendment, for which I am grateful. Uh, convener, I believe you wish me to speak to amendment 80 at this time as well. Yes, uh, please. So moving on, uh, this is about CPO completion rates, community payback order completion rates uh, having a particular threshold. Uh, throughout this bill or uh, as a, a result of this bill, 
it seems to me the Scottish Government is proposing something which will have a considerable expansion of the use of community sentences, and in particular community payback orders. This comes at a time when, and the Cabinet Secretary will clarify my statistics if, uh, if uh, I'm not spot on, but I think I am, that over three in ten community payback orders are not currently completed. So, within that context, my amendment requires a modest improvement to a specific measure that's contained within the criminal justice social work statistics, uh, which is the completion rate for community payback orders. Uh, yes, I will, but of course I may come back. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if the, the member in his um, preparation for today has given any thought uh, or, or done any research on some of the reasons why community payback orders are incomplete, or is he just simply interested in the figure of three and ten? Uh, oh, thank you for the information. Of course I've done research on why these things are, uh, are not being completed. Uh, but the, the bold fact, Mr McGregor, is that the completion rate for community payback orders currently stands at 69.7%, and that rate has remained virtually unchanged for around three years. So what I'm suggesting in my amendment is that if we don't have a basic improvement to that, if we don't put a threshold, if we don't put ourselves to a higher standard, we can have no confidence that community payback orders are a robust alternative to prison sentences. And perhaps more importantly, neither will the Scottish public. Yes, I will. I have a great deal of sympathy um, with uh, what the, the, the member is saying in terms of uh, ensuring that, that, that uh, non-custodial sentences and community payback orders are effective and that we seek improvements in that. However, in setting such a hard threshold, does it not run the risk of uh, creating aversion from sentences of the very kind that are actually uh, be counterproductive uh, to, to the intent that lies behind it. And, and, and indeed, could the member uh, uh, provide any uh, reason or rationale for why he's chosen the threshold of 80% in particular? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't accept that setting a hard threshold is a reason not to put ourselves to a high standard, actually, Mr Johnson. I think uh, if, it, if it makes an aversion to use community payback orders, uh, then that should be the right thing to do. Uh, because they're clearly not working. Three in ten are never completed, and unless we hold ourselves to a higher standard... Yes, I will, Mr Finney. Mr Kerr, I'm not minded to support your uh, amendment, as I'm sure you'd predict, but are you able to, to share the extent to which the information you gleaned on why there's that level of non-completion? Uh, how, how, what are the important factors in that that you learned, please? Well, for a start, I go back to the point at Amendment 76, uh, which is the point about resourcing. Uh, Mr Finney is well aware that an awful lot of the uh, agencies in place uh, to help people uh, and to assist in completion of various programmes are, I hesitate to say under-resourced because I don't want to say anything, uh, but it, they've certainly put forward that perhaps the m funding models and the amount of funding that they're getting preclude uh, a higher completion rate. So all that information's there. Uh, that information is perfectly available, but going back to uh, Daniel Johnson's point, why 80%? Because it is a higher standard, but it's only a modest higher standard. It's only an extra 10%. The, uh, the completion rate is currently 69.7%. I am suggesting that we need to give public confidence that the alternative, uh, that the increased use of community payback orders is actually the right thing to be doing. Now, I look back to some of the evidence that we heard in this committee. Victim Support Scotland told us that communities have no faith in community sentencing. And it's my view that this amendment could have helped to address that because the data will actively show that this is a robust and genuine alternative. Now, uh, anticipating where the Cabinet Secretary will go on this, rehabilitation of criminals is absolutely vital. I accept that, but it must never override public safety or real justice for victims of crime. Therefore, community sentences have to be robust, intensive and strictly monitored. And if we don't push for the improvement of these 
completion rates, we are sending a message that it is acceptable for three in ten offenders on community orders to go unpunished, unrehabilitated and undeterred. Now, I accept, Cabinet Secretary, and uh, picking up Daniel Johnson's point, this, this is pressure. I mean, a, a threshold of 80 per cent puts pressure on the system to deliver. Uh, it puts pressure on us to be confident that it is right to put more people into that system and that it can cope. But I'm sure that that is an appropriate principle, and I'm sure that this committee will vote for that principle. Uh, Lee MacArthur and, oh sorry, Daniel Johnson, I've missed you out, sorry Daniel. Um, to move amendments 76E and speak to uh, amendments. I won't take that personally, convener. Um, uh, the, the, uh, I'll just speak briefly to, to, to my amendment to uh, Amendment 76. I mean, I, I think Amendment 76 is welcome. I think much of what is contained in this bill is very reliant on resourcing. Uh, but also, in particular, I think what uh, we have discovered, both through taking evidence, but also the, the, the tragic circumstance that, that, that did occur, is that interagency working is also uh, particularly important. I think what I, I uh, uh, concluded is just the, the, the importance and the pivotal um, role of both the, the police and also local authorities in making sure that the, the ability to, to monitor conditions and carry out these regimes, um, uh, the, the, the resourcing of those uh, bodies in particular is hugely important, which is why I felt it was important to specify them um, in particular. I think it is all well and good um, uh, putting obligations and duties on bodies, uh, but I think not providing with them with the resources in order to carry out those duties is uh, a, a very dangerous thing to do, which is why this is uh, in here. Um, just briefly on uh, uh, Amendment 80, I would just say this. I, I, I think that um, uh, legislation should avoid uh, being anachronistic. And I, I think uh, Mr Kerr is uh, not being ambitious enough. I would hope to get to a point where 80 per cent is an absurdly pessimistic threshold by which to assess uh, community payback orders. And I say that partly in jest, but partly because I think it, it, it is a, 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 a potentially an unhelpful threshold that, it, that is arbitrary and one that actually genuinely we should be seeking to move well past but they present. However, I do agree with the sentiment that we must look to measures to improve the effectiveness and successfulness of these orders, but I just don't believe that Amendment 80 does that. Now, Liam MacArthur and Fulton. Liam MacArthur, Fulton. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Where I entirely agree with what Liam Kerr had to say uh, is that the issue of resources will be imperative to the success of um, the measures being brought forward in this bill. Where I depart from them entirely uh, is the suggestion that voting against this amendment, uh, 76, uh, would somehow send the signal from the committee uh, that we don't subscribe to that. Uh, view. We will all have debates at various stages about whether different aspects of the criminal justice system are properly resourced, uh, but I cannot see the benefit in putting in place um, this amendment, uh, albeit with a clarification from, from Daniel Johnson. We will have our robust discussions about the resourcing of different elements of the, uh, the criminal justice system going forward, and that is right and proper. But um, as a result of that, we will all take a different view as to whether or not um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the community measures are appropriately, uh, appropriately resourced. And therefore, we, uh, by passing Amendment 76, we stand at um, the, the, the serious risk of leaving ourselves in suspended animation and not being able to take forward any of these measures at all. In relation to uh, Amendment, I, I, I'm happy to take a, an intervention from Mr Kerr. Yeah, just I understand the point being made. Uh, how does the member propose then to ensure that there are sufficient resources in place, that somebody is making that assessment uh, on whatever threshold we decide sufficient resources means? By using the uh, powers that we have as parliamentarians to hold the government's feet to account, we will have a financial memorandum attached to this uh, bill which should give effect to the provisions within the bill. We have an opportunity at every budget uh, cycle uh, to, again, hold the government's feet to the fire that if areas of the criminal justice uh, system are not appropriately resourced, uh, then it is up to us to hold them to task based on the evidence that we have uh, available. I rather suspect what we will see is patchy and um, perhaps inconsistent uh, application of, of uh, community-based measures across the country, which will be the result of a variety of different um, uh, 
uh, factors, some of which may be to do with uh, resources, some of it may even be to do with the, uh, the, 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 the attitudes of individual sheriffs and, uh, and judges. Uh, so I think that is something, a, a debate we will continue to, to have, but it is not aided, I don't think, by passing this amendment. In terms of uh, Amendment 80, I, I would entirely agree with the points uh, made by uh, by Daniel Johnson earlier. I think this locks us into um, a, 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 a self-defeating exercise. The notion uh, that those, even those, the three out of ten that uh, Mr Kerr continues to refer to, um, may not uh, be considered unpunished or may be considered unpunished, uh, uh, unrehabilitated and, and undeterred. I think on the basis of the evidence that he's presented to the committee to substantiate uh, those claims um, I, is, is, is hard to fathom uh, and, and uh, hard to justify. I think uh, by putting in that rigidity to, to this bill, um, I think we, we, we run counter um, to, to what we know to be the case, uh, which is that um, very often um, the, uh, the, the period in prison can be self-defeating in terms of rehabilitation, in terms of reducing uh, reoffending, uh, and therefore I cannot understand uh, the logic of, of, of moving uh, Amendment 80, and we'll certainly be voting against it. Fulton. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, in terms of Amendments 76 and 78, I think the main points have um, already been covered by uh, Liam MacArthur that I would like to express and I, I won't be um, supporting them, but I wanted to con uh, concentrate my remarks on uh, Amendment 80, which I'm sorry uh, to say to my colleague um, Liam Kerr, I, I, I just honestly can't fathom out. I think it's shown a complete disregard for the criminal justice uh, system, particularly the social work aspect of the system and perhaps even a lack of understanding with it. First thing I would say is you, you, you're wanting to play a numbers game. People could argue that 70% is, is a pretty good success rate, given uh, what some individuals that would find themselves in these situations are, um, are dealing with. You didn't answer myself or John Finney's questions earlier around uh, some of the reasons, so I'll give you some of the reasons. Uh, people that have, there's very complex mental health difficulties, very complex drug and alcohol uh, difficulties, complex poverty issues, people needing to get to food banks, people needing to, uh, uh, people in the, the, the throes of austerity. Um, you know, these are all things that need to be taken into account and to throw figures out there is not helpful in the slightest. You've also got the figures of the 70 to 80 percent. I'll just make a wee bit of progress and I'll, I'll let you in because yeah, I know you've got a chance to sum up as well. That 70 to 80 percent, as Daniel Johnson says, why are you not just going for 100 percent on that basis? Um, and at least then your, uh, your argument would, would, would be consistent. No, I'll let you in. Uh, well, just on that point, I mean, I, I understand the reasons that you've given. Of course I do. My point is simply that statistically, 70%, 69.7% are completed. And I don't understand why we don't have the ambition, coupled with giving proper resources, to say this could and should be better before we start pumping more people into the system. So what I'm saying is I think that's where you're, you're, you're not showing your understanding of the system. But if we're going to give uh, people the opportunity to, um, to be rehabilitated in the community, which I think everybody around the table is supportive of, and there's a lot of work going into <coughs> within our communities and through the Scottish Government, then you need to understand that the, the offending and patterns of offending are very complex and they're linked into some of the things that I've already said, I, I really would, uh, uh, Liam, strongly encourage you to, to, to withdraw this amendment. I think you've got uh, the, the, whole, the whole mood totally wrong on it. And I think that actually gives it, uh, you know, uh, to even be talking in this sort of way, it's a dangerous road to be going down in terms of where we stand with community justice. It's this very start. I know you don't intend this, because I know you personally, uh, and, and I know that you don't intend this, but it's the start of a slippery road down to removing community justice as a key is a key feature of this, uh, uh, of this government, and I cannot fathom out why you've been down this road. So I will definitely, 100%, not be supporting that. I mean, if I could just remind the committee that in its report in relation to financial matters, the committee emphasises that an increase in the use of electronic monitoring will only be successful if adequate budgets are put in place for criminal justice, social work and the wider services that support people subject to such monitoring. These include help with housing, employment, all of that. A failure to make available sufficient resources will hinder the effective use of electronic monitoring, failing individuals involved and potentially increasing the risk to wider 
society. Additional resources may also be required to keep the use of electronic mo monitoring compliant with um, data protection rules. So it seems to me this essentially is an amendment um, about that resourcing. It's absolutely key to the success of this legislation that adequate resources are put in place and that's been made clear to us even before we started the scrutiny of this bill, making sure that um, adequate resources are there for things like community payback orders. In an ideal world, we'd want 100% um, compliance, but as Fulton McGregor says, then there are reasons why it can be unintended consequences. Um, it can be people with drug addiction, with chaotic lifestyles, but in seeking to, to um, give a community payback order, then I would expect all the, the recipients and the individual being considered, all their um, circumstances to be known and provided for. So we're not setting them up to fail. And I'm afraid that's what's happening just now. And resources are very much key to that failure. So it seems to me that this is, and um, Daniel Johnson's um, amendments are absolutely key to ensuring that people aren't set up to fail and that this legislation works as it was intended to do. And to do that, as Daniel Johnson said, you do need the cooperation of intergovernment agencies and organisations and voluntary organisations who must be adequately resourced. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, convener, and I thank uh, members for their explanation uh, of their amendments. Uh, it won't be any surprise to them that uh, I, won't, I won't be supporting them and I'll be asking them not to, to be pressed. Uh, it was a really good discussion, actually, to, to, to listen into um, from, from my point of view, particularly the points made by both uh, Lee MacArthur and Fulton McGregor just a, a moment ago. Uh, I'll, I'm going to go into some of the substance of the of, of the amendments. Before I do that, perhaps, um, I can just talk about Amendment <coughs> 76, making commencement regulations subject to the affirmative uh, procedure and why I think that is not the correct approach. Um, commencement regulations are typically not subject <coughs> excuse me, to procedure for good reasons of principle, uh, but also of practice. Parliament considers, it scrutinises, uh, it debates the provisions of the bill during the pill, bill's parliamentary passage. Um, in my view, it would not be useful to seek to have that debate again using subordinate legislation procedure. Um, to do so, commencement regulations uh, are a mechanism for giving effect to legislation which Parliament has already passed. Uh, commencement regulations themselves do not contain policy changes, but rather uh, are the tools to deliver the policy contained um, and the bill constraining Scottish ministers' powers to commence parts of legislation um, that this parliament has already approved uh, strikes at the, the core element, uh, I think, of any act. It's extremely uh, rare in statute to have a requirement placed on ministers before um, commencement by placing any condition on commencement. Um, there's a risk of potentially placing in jeopardy all parts of the bill, including issues such as parole, such as spent convictions, which seem unrelated to policy that is being linked with these amendments to commencement. Um, seeking to tie commencement to CPO completion rates uh, is also an approach that I find um, unusual. I do understand uh, Liam Kerr and other members' desire to have greater rates of completion. I'm also committed very much to doing that, but I thought Fulton McGregor's intervention was particularly um, uh, interesting, well made, I think articulated very well uh, indeed. Uh, anybody who has spoken to those who deliver community payback orders will know that they are dealing with people who often have chaotic lifestyles. And anybody who has gone through that um, a CPO that has that chaotic lifestyle, that has managed to transform their lives, that has managed to become rehabilitated, and I've spoken to many of them, will tell you that the journey was not a linear journey. The journey was often one step forward, two steps back. It had peaks and it had troughs. They went forward and then they went back. Um, and, and therefore, uh, believing that uh, sim simply throwing money, and I'll come back to the resource point, simply throwing money at this would see a higher completion rate, I'm afraid, does not take account of neither the evidence nor the lived experience of those that have gone through CPOs, exactly. of course. Um, I, I think it goes beyond throwing money. It's money to provide the support, to provide the personnel, 
to be there when they look as though they're, they're failing and be on top of that at the first available opportunity to provide that support, to see why they're failing, to then try and make the necessary arrangements to adjust the terms of the community service order to make, they are, to make sure they're compliant. That's what's not available just now, and it's not available just now very often because criminal justice, social work, and anyone else who monitors don't have the resources to do it. I would, I would respectfully disagree on, on a couple of points, Convener. One is, uh, it's important for me to say that we've, of course, ring-fenced the, the, the budget for criminal uh, justice social work. Not only that, of course, for an advance of um, hopefully passing the presumption against short sentences of 12 months, there's been an increased uh, uh, budget to, 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 to local authorities to address that particular issue. But what I would say, Convener, is even if we doubled the money going into the hands of, of, of those delivering community payback orders, there will be some people who will not complete them. There will be some people because of the chaotic lifestyles, as articulated well by, by, by Fulton uh, McGregor, that just will not um, complete. But I'd, again, I, I don't take away from the fact that there is a desire to see a greater increase uh, of completion rates of community payback orders, but this, I'm afraid, uh, is, 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 is not um, the way to do it. Um, yes, of course. I wonder, um, Cabinet Secretary, last month, or just recently, the government um, made an announcement that there would be additional funding for prison monitors. Now, was that throwing money at it, or was that addressing the issue um, and making sure that... Um, the legislation worked to encourage rehabilitation. Prison mentoring. Um, Monitors, mentoring, yes. Mentoring, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, again, I'm, I'm not suggesting that there isn't an issue uh, around resources. I know people will, 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 will always want to understand more resource, and of course resource is a part of the, the, the issue. I'm just simply making the point that if you were to, as I say, double the budget, quadruple the budget, you're still going to have people because of the points that were articulated well by Fulton McGregor, because of their chaotic lifestyles, because rehabilitation is not always a linear journey, that you'll have people who, who will not necessarily complete um, CPOs. That would not be a reason to dismiss the entire system, which I respect, Liam Kerr and, and Camino, you're not doing, but it would be, um, it would be as I said, the, the, the wrong approach, I think, to take. Um, I think placing a condition on, on commencement, <coughs> excuse me, in relation to CPO completion rates uh, is not the correct approach in general, but in respect of the framing of this particular amendment, I think there are some issues that would make it unworkable in practice. Um, I should say Amendment 80 prevents commen commencement until the statistics board has produced and published statistics on the proportion of CPO completion rates. The Statistic Board has functions and powers under uh, the Statistics and Registrations Act 2007. Um, crucially, the board is not required to produce statistics in relation to CPO completion rates. Uh, and the 2007 Act does not enable us to compel the board to produce those statistics. Um, this could mean that we're prevented from commencing, uh, even if the Scottish Government's own statistics show the requisite levels um, of CPO um, completion rates. We're also um, being asked to make com commencement contingent on placing a report before Parliament on why we consider um, setting up why we consider sufficient resources are in place um, for the other provisions. Parliament has already considered and approved the financial resolution for the bill. Uh, we've discussed the element uh, of uncertainty that always exists where justice services have to interact with sentencing and which are necessarily dependent on the behaviour of those passing sentences. Uh, we've set out in the financial memorandum illustrative costs that would apply dependent on how electronic monitoring is used by the courts. We've set out the budget increases we've made uh, in this area, including increased funding to social work services and increases to the electronic mo monitoring budget line. We've also made clear that our approach to the development of the service will be through seeking a pilot uh, of new technologies being used in, in setting up pilots, it will be at that point that we can look at the specific um, funding uh, that may be involved uh, if we were to, to, to of course, uh, enhance and roll out the service um, even further. But there is an important principle which Lee MacArthur um, rightly touched upon and articulated, which is um, here about seeking to separate out, separate out and consider budget allocations in this way. It's a responsibility of the Scottish Government to allocate its budget across all policy and legislative commitments. Um, and the annual budget process allows for detailed scrutiny of decision making in that respect. Um, seeking to separate that out and consider budgetary provisions on an act by act basis would be a departure from that established practice and not, um, I would say, a welcome one. In terms of Amendment 76A, um, it seeks to assess the impact of provisions prior to commencement, which again seems to place at risk the commencement of the bill. 
uh, and some elements of the bill which hitherto enjoyed positive support from members. Uh, the bill process is the way in which Parliament assesses anticipated impact. Requiring that Scottish ministers assess actual impact as a condition of commencement that seems an almost impossible condition to fulfil, which prevent any part of the bill um, being commenced. So I'd urge members not to press these amendments, and if they are pressed, then I would urge the committee to vote against them. Liam Kerr to wind up. Thank you, convener. As ever, I'm grateful to the committee and the cabinet secretary for the, the comments, which I think have uh, provided a lot of food for thought. That having been said, uh, just to address a, a, a couple of the, the important points. Uh, firstly, Liam MacArthur's point that the Cabinet Secretary just referred to about annual budgeting process. Uh, I understand the point being made, but I don't accept that it necessarily works. Uh, because if it did, presumably there wouldn't be departments, there wouldn't be areas who are saying we simply have not got enough funding and saying it consistently year on year. So I do accept the point. I'm just not convinced that it's a reason not to uh, go forward with the amendment. Of course. Very, very grateful. Um, no, it certainly shouldn't, and I certainly wasn't arguing that it, it, um, it should suggest that any of us um, have a, don't have a responsibility to, 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 to monitor this, to, to hold the government account, probably through the annual uh, budget uh, cycle. But uh, William Kerr, like myself, voted in favour of this bill at stage one, along with the financial memorandum, which in a sense expressed the uh, estimated cost. And I think, as the Cabinet Secretary rightly said, there is an element of, of, of estimation there that, that only really bears out once uh, the, the legislation impacts uh, with reality. I think at that point, it is abs absolutely incumbent on this committee in particular to hold the government to account to make sure those resources um, uh, are, are in place where they need to be in, in place. But setting out the amendment as he does and to, to front load that process um, seems to be um, uh, utterly the wrong way uh, around to, to, to do it. And, and as I say, it's a departure from um, the, the, the vote expressed at, at stage one, which um, saw Parliament accept the financial memorandum uh, to this bill. Grateful to Liam MacArthur for the intervention. I'm going to muse on that as, as I go through the next amendment, if I may. Uh, the perhaps more substantive point uh, was made by Mr McGregor, uh, and he suggested that this, uh, my amendment uh, would be a, slope, a slippery slope to removing community justice. I fundamentally don't accept that, Mr. McGregor. I, you know, he, he says it as if it's uh, my personal preference, and so I'll, I'll come back on that basis. I absolutely, absolutely support community justice. My point is, and it, to my mind, it's a very simple one. We must resource community justice properly. Otherwise, as the convener quite rightly says, we set it up to fail. I'll let you back in in a minute, if I may. We set up community justice to fail if we do not properly resource it. Whatever resource is taken to mean, whether it be financial, whether it be in terms of provision. And my point with the amendment is that I believe that we can do better if we support community justice properly, if we improve the outcomes before we introduce further electronic monitoring, then I think we can hold ourselves to a higher standard. So, and I'm aware you're waiting to come in. I, I would argue I am fully in support of these community alternatives, but we must fund them properly to ensure the right interventions for the right challenges that both you and Mr Finney uh, brought up and deal with the chaotic lifestyles that the Cabinet Secretary refers to, to ensure the outcomes are increasingly delivered. And Mr McGregor, you asked me why not set it at 100%, and I think the Cabinet Secretary answered that question exactly right and succinctly. There will be some who won't complete it, there will be some who can't complete it. He's absolutely right to say so. I'll take the intervention. Yeah, thanks for that intervention. I just, I just want to take the opportunity to make it clear that I did actually say um, when I spoke earlier that I didn't think it was your personal view. Uh, that, that you would want to dilute community justice in Scotland. However, I think that I would want to make the point again that that is where everything starts. It starts with a policy level. It starts with ideology. It starts with changes. Um, and I would predict um, even talk li like this, a, a committee like this, could start diluting the importance of community justice and lead to more punitive approaches. And that, that is my view. 
um, on the way you went. In terms of the, the, the funding uh, aspect of it, of course, criminal justice social work needs to be uh, funded fully, and criminal justice social work has been uh, has been funded uh, even in the climate of uh, of uh, you know difficult um, funding capacity by the government. Um, I think that most people in the criminal justice sector believe that, that there's been a uh, that there's been a reasonable settlement. Just, just on that very point, actually, uh, I, I just want to ask Liam Kerr whether he has a figure in mind that would satisfy him in terms of the additional spend that should be spent in terms of the resourcing, because uh, the points that Fulton McGregor makes are correct uh, and that I've made previously around the increase or well, the ring fencing of the budget in Community Justice Scotland, plus additional money in terms of the electronic monitoring budget line, etc., etc. But does he have a figure then in mind that would satisfy him in terms of the commencement of this? to additionally resource um, uh, partners that deliver community sentences? Uh, well, no, I don't, because that, that exercise requires the Scottish Government or the, the resources that the Scottish Government has to assess the landscape and what needs to be put in place and the uh, requirements of the sector to say, this is what we need. Th these are the specific resources in terms of cash, in terms of uh, discipline, in terms of uh, personnel resource, if I might put it that way, uh, to deliver the service to deliver the extra 10% uh, uplift that my amendment cries out for. I, and just uh, again to, to come back on uh, Mr McGregor's point, I, I, I hear what he's saying. I, he concluded that the possible consequence of this would be to dilute community justice, and, or he is concerned looking at this amendment that it would dilute community justice and lead to more punitive approaches. I would argue this is the exact opposite of that, which I, I think we're agreeing on is the right approach uh, to, to take the, the exact contrary to that position. Uh, having said all of that, uh, I, I'm moving two amendments here, and I've listened very carefully to the debate. It, taking the second one first, Amendment 80, uh, the Cabinet Secretary put a, a, a point in, uh, a practical point I think, which if I heard it right, he was saying that the, the amendment, if it was inserted, could prevent the act, or the, the crucial sections of the act, coming in by virtue of the statistics board not producing statistics which they are not mandated to produce. So in the unlikely event that they didn't, but nevertheless the possible event, we could have an amendment that prevented the bringing in of the Act. Uh, I am persuaded by that. That does seem uh, a reasonable challenge, and for that, move, uh, for that reason, I don't think it would be competent for me to press that particular amendment. Come to that when we deal with your amendment. Daniel Johnson, to wind up on amendment. But I haven't dealt with my first amendment, oh, you uh, finished, which I'll okay. do now. Uh, which is the, the amendment concerning the resources. And again, because I've listened to the debate quite closely, I was actually, as you saw, I listened carefully to what Liam MacArthur was saying. Uh, and I think he does make a reasonable point on which I would prefer more time to muse because I think it is a good point. Uh, and for that reason, at this stage, I think it would be uh, the best thing to do not to press the amendment if I'm so permitted. Okay. Daniel Johnson to wind up on Amendment 76A, press or withdraw. Um, I will uh, press that amendment. The question is that Amendment 76A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Three, six, three in favour. Um, three in favour, six against. That amendment is not agreed. Uh, Liam Kerr to press or withdraw Amendment 76. At this as stage, amended. convener, it wasn't I amended. choose to withdraw. Any objection? Do uh, members have any objection to this being withdrawn? They don't. The quest, um, call Amendment 80 in the name of Liam Kerr already debated with Amendment 76. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. That's okay. Okay. The question is that amendment um, section. section 49 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Uh, call amendment 68 in the name of Daniel Johnson already debated with amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Not moved. 
uh, not moved. Call Amendment 69 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Um, call Amendment 70 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. <coughs> Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 127 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 111, Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 127 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We're not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. And those against, please show. Eight in favour, one, one against. That amendment is agreed to. The question is the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I will agree. That ends stage two consideration of the management of Offenders Scotland Bill. The bill will now be reprinted as, amendment at, uh, as amended at stage two. And Parliament, as Parliament has not yet uh, determined when stage two will be heard, uh, held, then members will be informed of this in due course, along with the deadline for um, uh, lodging um, stage three amendments. In the meantime, stage three amendments can be lodged with the clerks uh, in the legislation team. I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for attending and suspend um, for a five minute conference break.
Agenda item three is feedback from the meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on 4th April. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments on question or questions. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and invite John Finney to provide that feedback. Yeah, thank you, convener. Uh, as you say, the, the committee has a feedback note on, in its papers on the most recent meeting of the subcommittee, and that was a private session on 34th April, at which time we considered and agreed a report on Police Scotland's proposal to introduce the use of cyber kiosks throughout Scotland. Now that report was published on Monday the 8th of April and a copy was provided to members of the Justice Committee for information. Uh, the subcommittee also agreed its work, pro <coughs> excuse me, work programme up to the summer recess. It agreed to invite Police Scotland and the Police Authority to give evidence on cyber kiosk report at its next meeting on Thursday 9th May and to invite the Cabinet Secretary for Justice to give evidence in early June. Finally, uh, the subcommittee agreed to begin its pre-budget scrutiny of the Scottish Government's 2020-21 draft budget by taking evidence in late May on the policing capital budget. So, thank, you. thank you very much. Do members have any questions? No. Important piece of work going on there, and I think the subcommittee has excelled itself in um, scrutinising this and um, potentially saving uh, or avoiding all sorts of problems. Liam MacArthur. I, I, thanks very much, Convener. I entirely agree with those uh, sentiments. I think at the outset it wasn't entirely clear where this was going to end up, but I think it's, it's demonstrated uh, the, the, the value over uh, recent months. I, I think equally the, the recent headlines in terms of some of the uh, questions being raised in relation to the use of similar technology south of the border uh, may give the, the subcommittee an opportunity to share some of the, the work we've been doing with the counterparts um, in the House of Commons, because I'm sure it'll be of, of interest to, to colleagues there too. Yeah, I think that's an, an excellent idea, Convener. Is, is there anything you want to add to that? I think that's an excellent proposal and, and clearly a lot of these issues are dealt with on a UK-wide basis so um, you know, reference to uh, the House of Commons would be helpful I think. Thank you for that. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Um, the committee will be undertaking a fact-finding visit to Kilmarnock Prison to Kilmarnock Prison next week so our next meeting is on Tuesday 14th of May. We now move into private session. <laughs>